The subject I've been given is Bar Kokhba's Rebellion, the Second Jewish Revolt. First frame, please. Bar Kokhba's Rebellion, the Second Jewish Revolt, circa 120 to 132 AD, the Second Jewish Rebellion against Rome. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 5, verse 43. The Gospel of St. John, chapter 5, verse 43. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another shall come in his own name, you will receive him. Jesus makes a prediction that somebody was going to come in his own name who would be received by the Jews as the Messiah. There have been a number of people claiming to be the Messiah since the time of Jesus who were even on a wide level, accepted as the Messiah by many Jews, and in some cases, by most. Most recently was the former Rebbe, Rabbi, of the Chabad, or Lubavitch Hasidic movement, Rabbi Menachem Schneerson. He was claimed to be the Messiah. Now, you have to understand the way Hasidic Judaism works. It's a dynasty. They believe only the Rebbe, only their Rabbi, can go to God directly. You have to go to God through him. He's like the guru. But it goes from father to son, and if there's no son, a son-in-law. But he has no son and no son-in-law when he died. So they believe he has to raise from the dead. And they go around trying to, with something called the mitzvah tank, trying to get Jews to put on tefillin. Well, I didn't tell them my mother's Gentile. And one time I was in the airport in Tel Aviv, Ben Gordian Airport, and they tried to get me to put on the fill in, and they had the big picture of him, Melech Mashiach, King Messiah. So I said, well, what are you going to do now? You have no Messiah. You have no Rebbe. He has no son, no son-in-law. What are you going to do without a Rebbe? You can't go to God. And they said to me in Hebrew, he's going to raise from the dead. And I said, what? He's going to raise from the dead. And if you go to Queens in New York, they actually have a vigil around his grave waiting for him to get up. So I said to them, you believe the Jewish Messiah had to come and die and then raise from the dead? And they said, yes. I said, that's all I wanted to know. <laughs> Schneerson made many wild predictions, including that the Messianic redemption would come in 1991 by Rosh Hashanah, October of that year. Of course, it did not. Then he died, and now the Hasidic movement is in a crisis, certainly the Lubavitch, the Chabad, unless he gets up from the dead. Well, he was the most recent. In the Middle Ages, there was somebody called Shabbatai Svi. Shabbatai Svi was so successful in convincing the Jews he was the Messiah that from North Africa to England, it was widely believed. Russia, Galicia, Austria, Germany, France, the overwhelming majority of rabbis believed it and convinced their congregations he was the Messiah. He, of course, was not. He died, and then somebody else came along called Jacob Frank, who allowed people to believe he was the reincarnation of Shabbat Tzvi. Many rabbis believed in him. He converted to Islam. There's been many people like this who the rabbis on a wide scale have proclaimed to be the Messiah. But the first major one after the rejection of Jesus was Simon Bar Kokhba. Simon Bar Kokhba. Shimon Bar Kokhba. Jesus gives this prophecy. Somebody who would be proclaimed to be the Messiah and who the people would believe. Look with me, please, to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. Moses, writing in the Torah, says the following, I will raise up a prophet from among your countrymen, like you. 
I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. One of your brothers, it actually says in Hebrew. The rabbis are generally agreed. In fact, they're uniformly agreed, even in the Talmudic literature, that this is a prophecy about the Messiah. He would come in the character of Moses. And if he is rejected, it says, I will require it of any Jew who rejects him. The two kinds of people who are descendants of Abraham are the Jews and Arabs. They are both accursed. The Arab nations, because of the lie of Islam, are under the curse of Esau and Ishmael. That curse can only be broken at the cross. So too, unbelieving Israel is under the curse of the law. The curse of the law that they cannot keep. Daniel predicted the Messiah would have to come and die before the second temple would be destroyed. The Messiah came, the Messiah died, the temple was destroyed. Hence, biblical Judaism can no longer exist. It has not existed since 70 AD. Look with me, please, to Jeremiah chapter 2. Verse 13, Jeremiah gives a striking prophetic prediction. For my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountains of living water. Now we know from John chapter 7, the fountain of living water is Jesus. Jeremiah predicts they'd reject the one who'd give the living water. And of course, Jesus defines the living water as the Holy Spirit. They'd reject the Messiah. But once rejecting the Messiah, they would do something else. They would hoo for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In other words, they would invent the spiritually bankrupt religion. That is what rabbinic Judaism is. That is what Talmudic Judaism is, a spiritually bankrupt religion that can hold no water. Literally and exactly fulfilling the prophecies of Jeremiah 2.13, my people would reject me, the fountain of living water, that reject the Messiah who gave the Holy Spirit, to who for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water, they would invent another religion. Well, that happened. So Deuteronomy 18, a Messiah would come in the character of Moses, and if he's rejected, God would require it of them. Now they can no longer keep the Torah. The only way to keep the Torah is for the Torah to be kept in Messiah, the one who fulfilled it on our behalf. That's the only way the Torah can be kept. So now you're left with the consequences of not keeping the Torah. John 5.43 gives the prophecy, you'll reject the true Messiah, but if another comes in his own name, you'll accept him as the Messiah. The first one who did that after Jesus was again Bar Kokhba. Then Deuteronomy 18, the Messiah would be a prophet like Moses. Any Jew who did not believe it, that would be it. God would require it of them. Now we get to Leviticus 26. Look with me, please. Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 essentially reiterate the same things. Verse 14, but if you do not obey me and do not carry out these commands, if instead you reject my statutes and your soul abhors my ordinance so as not to carry out all my commandments and so break my covenant, it's impossible for Israel to keep all of his commandments with no temple and no high priesthood. They couldn't keep it even if they wanted to unless they accepted the Messiah. I, in turn, will do this to you. I will appoint over you a sudden terror, consumption, fever, shall waste away, eyes that cause the soul to pine away. 
You shall sow your seed uselessly, for your enemies shall eat it up. Then it goes on speaking about how he's going to strike them down. Verse 19, I will break down your pride of power. I will make your sky like iron and your earth like bronze. And your strength shall be spent uselessly, for your land shall not yield its produce, and the trees of the land shall not yield their fruit. That literally happened for centuries. The land laid waste. It was either malarial-infested swamps or else it was allowed to turn to desert. Verse 21, If then you will act with hostility against me and are unwilling to obey me, I will increase the plague on you seven times according to your sins. Verse 24, Then I will act with hostility against you, and I, even I, will strike you seven times for your sins. I will bring upon you a sword which will execute vengeance for the covenant and when you gather together into your cities, I will send pestilence among you, so that you shall be delivered into enemy hands. This, of course, commenced in 70 A.D. in the cities. There were other cities destroyed other than Jerusalem, but Jerusalem was by far the worst. Verse 27, Yet if in spite of this you do not obey me but act with hostility against me, then I will act with wrathful hostility against you. I, even I, will punish you seven times for your sins. Further, you shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters you shall eat, as happened when the first temple was destroyed and as happened in the fall of Samaria in 721. Verse 31, I will lay waste your cities as well and make your sanctuaries desolate. I will not smell your soothing aromas. In other words, the sacrifices would stop. There'd be no more temple. Notice it's progressive. This is going to happen, but if you still don't repent, then it's going to get worse. 70 A.D. was the beginning. Bar Kokhba was the conclusion. After 70 A.D., they saw something happen. Daniel's prophecy was fulfilled. The temple was destroyed. Where's the Messiah? Where's the Messiah? Next frame, please. I'd like to tell you the tale of two rabbis. You had the Sadducees and the Pharisees as the main two schools of Judaism in the time of Jesus, the Second Temple period. I think I explained this once a long time ago here in Tempe. There were other sects. There were cult groups like the Essenes. There were Herodians. There were various groups, Samaritans who were Mongol Jews, but of the mainstream Jews, the two main sects were the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Sadducees being more heterodox, the Pharisees being more orthodox. The Pharisees had two schools, two rabbinic schools, academies where their rabbis were educated, the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel. The school of Hillel was the more important. The school of Shammai was highly, highly legalistic. The school of Hillel was the main one. Rabbi Hillel founded it, and he had a grandson named Rabbi Gamaliel. Turn with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 5. Rabbi Gamaliel is esteemed in the Mishnah, in the Jewish literature. Orthodox Jews will esteem him to this day. In fact, in the Mishnah it says that when he died, righteousness perished from the earth. That's how esteemed he was in the eyes of his fellow rabbis. He was seen as a personification of a tzaddik, of a righteous one. In verse 33, but when they heard this, that is the charges against the apostles... They were cut to the quick and were intending to slay them. But a certain Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the Torah, this is the grandson of Rabbi Hillel, respected by all the people, stood up in the council. That is the Sanhedrin. And he gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you purpose to do with these men, that is the apostles. 
For some time ago, Theudas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined up with him. And he was slain, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. Notice, even before Jesus arrived on the scene, there were false prophets and false messiahs raising up, misleading the people. This fulfills the prophecies of Isaiah. Turn with me, please, for one moment to Isaiah chapter 8. In Isaiah 9, we have the prophecy about the birth of the Messiah, bearing in mind there's no chapter divisions in the original Hebrew text. Isaiah 9, a child is born, a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder, and I can't wait for that. No more Israel, as David Hawking puts it, no more listening to the wrong bush, and no more abominations. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Peli Yoetz. That term, Peli, is only ever used for God. Why do you ask my name, asked the angel, for it is Peli, the angel of the Lord. Wonderful Counselor, Peli Yoetz. Mighty God, El Gabor. Okay. Everlasting Father, Avi Ad, and Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom, a prophecy about the birth of the Messiah. But look what precedes it in the previous chapter, verse 19. When they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? Before Jesus came the first time, there was an explosion of occult activity, including necromancy, people communicating with the dead. There was an upsurge of this and many false messiahs. I'm only again stating facts. Benny Hinn talks about how he goes to the grave of Amy McPherson at Forest Lawn Cemetery in Los Angeles. He goes to her grave and how he's communicated with her. He said that. Earl Park, who died about eight months ago or so, was the same thing. He was into communicating with his deceased sister Joan. Um, these are people who say they're believers, you understand. So much of what's happening today in the church that is being propagated as gifts of the Spirit is not biblical charismata, but these things are in fact occult in nature and practice. I have warned multiple times, so much of what is being falsely branded as prophecy today is in fact clairvoyance which is not to deny the biblical gifts of prophecy or tongues or anything else. It's simply saying that they're being counterfeited widely. Well, let's look further. So we see that there would be an upsurge of occult activity before the Messiah was to come the first time, and many false prophets and false Christs drawing people away from them. Many of them were just crackpots. And today it's not much different. These things being practiced in the emergent church, like contemplative prayer, the Lectio Divina, and so forth, these things are occult practices. And, of course, the adherents and those who are following these people are crackpots. But let's go back to Rabbi Gamaliel in Acts chapter 5. He warns them, look, we've had false messiahs before. Jesus is only the latest person claiming to be the messiah. Verse 38, he says, And so in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men, that is the apostles, and let them alone. For if this plan or action should be of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may even be found fighting against God. And they took his advice, and after calling the apostles, they flogged them and ordered them to speak no more in the name of Jesus, and then released them. 
So they went away from their presence of the council, rejoicing that they'd been considered worthy to suffer shame in, in his name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Messiah. <laughs> Rabbi Gamaliel, when he died, the Mishnah says, righteousness perished with him, said, if Jesus is not the Messiah, Christianity will not last. <laughs> That's their own great sage one of their greatest sages, the one who to them personified righteousness. He said, if Jesus is not the Messiah, Christianity will not last. Well, it has lasted. So they got a problem. He was again the grandson of Rabbi Hillel. Now, in this rabbinic academy, the school of Hillel, where Rabbi Gamaliel was the teacher, he trained these other rabbis, and he had a number of famous students. One was Rabbi Anklios. Anklios. Anklios translated one of the two main translations of the Hebrew Scriptures into Aramaic, called the Targums. He has the Targum Anklios. And it's quite interesting reading. He translated the Old Testament into Aramaic, Rabbi Anklios. Very important figure in Jewish history. Another one of his prize students was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. And then he had a third very famous student, a classmate of the other two, virtually, Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus, better known as St. Paul the Apostle. All trained by Gamaliel. Well, something happened. Jesus and Daniel predicted the destruction of the temple. It happened. You can read the events surrounding it and leading up to it in the Wars of the Jews by Josephus. If you want to know what the Great Tribulation is like, read what happened in 70 AD. It is a foreshadowing and a microcosm of what's going to happen to the entire planet. And the way God's people were miraculously delivered out, as John pointed out, they went to a place called Pella, not Petra, but Pella, and the Transjordan. The people kept misinterpreting the signs as positive omens. A comet in the shape of a sword over Jerusalem, the gates of Jerusalem only takes 24 men to open, would sw swing open by itself. And visions of Roman armies attacking in the clouds were seen, and people kept misinterpreting the, the omens. False prophets were saying these things were positive signs. I remember September 11th when the Twin Towers crashed in New York that Kenneth Copeland said, Satan has now shot himself in the foot. Now we're going to see one billion Muslims saved. <laughs> Yet people still give him money. It's unbelievable. They kept misinterpreting the signs that judgment was coming. Except the faithful believers who at that time were led by Simeon, the cousin of Jesus, who became the pastor in Jerusalem following the martyrdom of the Apostle James. The siege in Jerusalem began at Passover time, the same time when Jesus was rejected. And in fact, the early Christians in Jerusalem in part, saw the Roman siege under Titus in 70 AD as a judgment for the martyrdom of James. The temple gets destroyed, but the Jews are not yet scattered from the land. Remember Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28. If you will still, first the judgment will come to your cities, but if you will still not hearken, then I will scatter you among the nations. Another judgment had to follow 70 AD that would drive the Jews out of the land, not just destroy the temple, but drive them out of the land for 1,900 years. Well, something happens when the temple's destroyed in fulfillment of the prophecies of Jesus and Daniel. The rabbis had a problem. What do we do now? No temple, no high priesthood, at least none that can sacrifice. We can't practice the Torah. What are we going to do now? 
So Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai convenes a council at Yavne. And they agree on the canon of the Old Testament. It had already been accepted, but they formalized it liturgically. And they made some decisions. Basically, the decisions were, well, instead of the Levites, we're going to have a rabbi. <laughs> and instead of a temple, we're going to have the synagogue. <laughs> and instead of the mitzvot of the Torah, we're going to have the mitzvot, the oral law. The Torah be'al pei, man-made traditions, equating it as equal authority. In other words, they invented a different religion, just as Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13 predicted. They would reject me, the fountain of living water, the one who gives the Holy Spirit, to who for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. That was the birth of rabbinic Judaism which over a period of time and centuries evolved into what we would today call Talmudic Judaism. Talmudic Judaism, a fulfillment of Jeremiah's warning and prediction. That was at the Council of Yavne. That's where it began. But he had another classmate, Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus, who initially, of course, persecuted Jewish believers in Jesus ruthlessly until he was encountered by Christ himself on the road to Damascus. The one who rode with the hunters would now run with the foxes. St. Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle realized Jesus was the Messiah and preached it to Jew and Gentile. Well, again, at the time of his death, when Gamaliel, their teacher, died, people said, that's it, righteousness has perished. We have no tzaddik as righteous as this one. When his student, Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai, died, he was called by his disciples the mighty hammer, the mighty hammer, according to the Mishnah. And when the mighty hammer died, he was weeping on his deathbed, according to the Mishnah. This is what the Orthodox Jews teach themselves. And his disciples and other rabbis who he had trained came to him saying, O oh, mighty hammer, <coughs> why do you weep? Why do you weep so, O oh, mighty hammer? And the mighty hammer replied, I'm about to meet Hashem, God, blessed be his name. And there are before me two roads, one leading to paradise and one leading to Gehenna and I know not to which he is going to sentence me. The founder of rabbinic Judaism, the founder of the Judaism you see today on his deathbed died in terror. He died in fear, crying out he did not know if he did the right thing or not, unsure if he was going to spend eternity in heaven or in hell. That's how he died. That is how the founder of Judaism in its present form died. Terrified by his own dying deathbed confession, not sure if he did the right thing at Yavne. But then there was his classmate, <coughs> Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus, cum Paul the Apostle. He suffered many things. In 70 AD, Yochanan ben Zakkai was smuggled out of Jerusalem during the Roman siege in a coffin. <laughs> That's how he survived it. We got to save the mighty hammer. And we see what happened to him. He went to Yavne and he reorganized Judaism as a religion based on man-made tradition, fulfilling Jeremiah's prophecy. His classmate, Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus, Paul the Apostle, on his deathbed, he said something different. He was not crying and weeping, saying, I do not know if I'm going to heaven or hell or if I did the right thing or not. On his deathbed, his confession to his disciples was very different indeed. I have run the good race. 
I have fought the good fight. Henceforth, I know there is indeed laid up for me a crown of righteousness. <laughs> to this day, every Jew will follow one of these two classmates, both trained by Rabbi Gamaliel, who Christians are familiar with from the book of Acts chapter 5. They will either follow the rabbinic Judaism that has become the Talmudic Judaism of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, or they will follow the Judaism of his classmate, today popularly referred to as Messianic Judaism, those Jews who believe Jesus is the Messiah, the natural branches of the church. Tale of two rabbis. That's set the stage for Bar Kokhba. And so from 70 AD until the time of Bar Kokhba's rebellion, it was the most evangelistically fruitful time in history in the evangelism of Jews. They had a problem. Daniel's prophecy. Where's the Messiah? It must have been Jesus. A semi-academic Jewish author and a very popular Jewish historian for popular readership is Max Demont. He is probably the most popular Jewish historian in, in the non-academic slash semi-academic literary circuit alive today. In his classic book, God, the Jews, and History, Max Demont admits, citing many sources, that by the time of Bar Kokhba's rebellion, at least 25% of the Jews in Jerusalem believed Jesus to be the Messiah. One out of four Jews in Jerusalem by a conservative estimate. In other areas, it was a higher percentage, including certain places in Galilee, where they lingered until the 6th century. But then it began to change. Once the Messiah came and died, the temple would be destroyed. Biblical Judaism could no longer exist. So now Jews begin turning to Christ in very large numbers indeed. Next frame, please. Something happens in approximately 90 A.D., nobody's sure of the exact date, called the Bekat Hamanim, the Bekat Hamanim, where people who do not follow the line of rabbinic Judaism, including Jewish believers, and especially Jewish believers, are excommunicated from the synagogue. They're thrown out now. Up until this time, many Jewish believers continued to worship in the synagogue, as well as in fellowships. They attended both simultaneously, as we see in the book of Acts. Now they get kicked out of the synagogue. As Jesus said, they'll put you out of the synagogues, and whoever kills you will think they're honoring God. That was the Bekat Hamanim. The Romans, around that time, begin issuing coins. Actually, it's shortly thereafter. On these coins are engraved something from the Arch of Titus, found in Rome, where the Romans are celebrating the plundering of the booty from the temple, carrying the menorah, the lamps, and sacred objects of worship from the temple. It's still on the Arch of Titus, opposite the Colosseum, at the entrance to the Forum of Rome to this day. This coin begins to inspire national indignation. The biggest city is the port city, expanded by Herod, and the port built by Herod the Great, Caesarea, really a Greco-Roman city with a Jewish population, but predominantly a Greco-Roman city. It was the actual headquarters of Pilate. Pilate came to Jerusalem to the Fortress Antonio, but his base was in Caesarea. Caesarea Maritina, not Caesarea Felipe, the one on the Mediterranean coast. Absolutely imaginative engineering for those days, where they would sink ships to make breakwaters to artificially construct a port. And today it's still the largest um, underwater archaeological dig in the world. Rabbi Akiva 
was a descendant of Gentiles who converted to Judaism. He has massive, massive Bible studies on the Mount of Olives, Harzayatim, sometimes attended by up to 100,000 people. And he trained his disciples to memorize long passages of the Torah and of portions of the prophets. This is Rabbi Akiva. But something happens in Kesaria. The second Jewish revolt is fueled. Riots begin to take place in some measure in reaction to these coins that insulted the people. It would be like the United States putting out a coin of an atomic bomb mushroom cloud over Hiroshima and spending the money in Japan. <laughs> Something they preferred not to be reminded of. The second revolt begins. The people are desperate now for a messianic redemption. We know the most of what we know about Bar Kokhba from an Israeli general who was also a famous archaeologist called Igal Yadin. He wrote the book on Bar Kokhba, and the book offended some people because it told the truth about Bar Kokhba, what he was really like. At one point, Bar Kokhba kicked a 90-year-old rabbi in the head and killed him. Bar Kokhba was called by some people who didn't like him, Bar Koziva, son of a lie. But his actual name, Simon, Shimon Bar Kokhba, meant Simon, son of a star. Rabbi Akiva ascribed to him the prophecy of Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. Turn with me, please, to Numbers 24, 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob, and a scepter shall arise from Israel, and shall crush through the forehead of Moab, and tear down all the sons of Sheth. This is a messianic prophecy. Remember, there was a star when Jesus was born, at least as, as is recorded. However, what we see here is this, the term scepter, scepter. They associated this, quite logically, with Genesis 49, the prophecy of Jacob, because both verses, Genesis, in Genesis 49 and in Numbers 24, named not only a scepter, but Jacob. And they were using a principle of biblical interpretation called binyan ab ketubim, building an argument, a theological argument from two texts, from something called the Midot of Rabbi Hillel. Again, the teacher of Gamaliel, the grandfather of the teacher of Paul and Ankylos and ben Yohanan Benzakai. The prophecy of Jacob of the scepter in Genesis 49 was this, concerning the tribe of Judah. Verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Shiloh was, of course, where the Holy Ark was kept for 200 years before Jerusalem had its temple in the time of David and Solomon onward. It was kept in Shiloh for 200 of those years. But it became a popular metaphor for the Messiah. Notice the scepter. The national political rule would not depart from the tribe of Judah until he came. Well, with the Herodians... You had non-Davidic kings, people who were not descendants of David. In fact, they were not even proper Jews. They were Nabataeans. They were descendants of people from Moab and Edom who converted to Judaism in the Hasmonean period. Again, as Ronnie rightly pointed out, <coughs> Herod was culturally a Roman. He was ethnically a Nabataean, Idumean, and he was 
a Jew by religion, only by way of religious convenience. So if Shiloh hasn't come, what are we going? Where's the king? The scepter's departed. They were desperate. The temple's gone. The scepter's departed from Judah. So Rabbi Akiva gets a hold of this prophecy from Numbers 24, 17. A star is going to come. People always look for a rising star. Things have not changed much. When they stop looking to God, they look for a rising star. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. Rabbi Akiva said this was Bar Kokhba. He's the Messiah. And in desperation, people began flocking to him. This was seen as their last chance as a nation. They followed this guy, claiming him to be the Messiah. His victory was inevitable. He's going to fulfill these prophecies. He's going to bring the kingdom dominion. So they said. The Jewish believers had long returned from their exile to where they escaped in 70 AD from the Transjordan. They, they came back from Pella and flourished. Again, very high percentage of Jews accepted Jesus as the Messiah in this period between 70 AD, the first revolt, and the second revolt. Initially, the Jewish believers as Jews fought against the Romans when it was purely a national war. However, once Rabbi Akiva proclaimed Bar Kokhba to be the Mashiach, the Messiah, they no longer could follow another Messiah. They would no longer support the cause of a false Messiah. So they were excommunicated, not just from the synagogue as they were with the Bekat Menim, now they were excommunicated from the Jewish community. They were relegated to the status of pagans, effectively. Now you're out of the community, not just out of the synagogue. They all rallied and fought with Bar Kokhba. For a while, he seemed to be successful. His initial success caused more people to join him and extol him as a great savior. In fact, for a period that extended up to nearly six years, they had a de facto independence from Rome. But then Hadrian came. The Emperor Hadrian, the same one who built the wall across the north of England. And things changed. They were brutally massacred in something that was worse than 70 AD. The ultimate battle, the final one, was at Batar. Batar is south of Jerusalem, not that far from Ramat Rahel. That's where it is. And something happened. There were caves there. And the fires that were set by the Romans and on the battle, they first used fire in, in, as a military strategy. The people began running into the caves. And it looked just like the prophecies of the Tanakh and of the book of Revelation. People will go into the caves and say, do the rocks fall on us? And the early Christians saw this happening. And then something happened. After the second revolt was put down, the Jews were exiled. They were exiled totally from Jerusalem and from the areas around Jerusalem. The headquarters of Judaism became Tiberias, even though they called it the Jerusalem Talmud. It was written in Tiberias. And another leader eventually came called Yehuda Hanasi, and from, he began actually writing down the oral law. And from there, Judaism evolved into Talmudic Judaism. They were driven out of the land. That was the beginning of the dispersion. Hence the prophecies of Deuteronomy 18. The Messiah would come like Moses, give another covenant. If you reject him, I will require it of you. The curse of the law, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, was in stages. If you will still not hearken to my voice, if you will still not hearken to my voice, the judgment began in 70 AD, but God gave them further respite to accept the Messiah. 
by Bar Kokhba's rebellion when they proclaimed another man to be the Messiah, it led to their utter destruction and scattering. Next frame, if we have one. I think that's it. One more. That's it. That's what happened. That's why it happened. That's how it happened. Now let's talk about what is going to happen. What does this mean for us? What does this mean for the nation Israel? There are many types of the Antichrist in Scripture and in history. To begin with, how did the Romans get there? After the Hasmonean period, the Hasmoneans were the descendants of the Maccabees. They made a tree with Rome and invited them to come in. They looked to man instead of to their God for their national security. They thought they were going to be a Roman protectorate. The Romans will protect us. No, the Romans controlled them. They found themselves not a protectorate, but a colony. The Roman general Pompey enters the Holy of Holies. When anyone other than the high priest on the Day of Atonement enters the Holy of Holies, it's a picture of Hashikutz HaMeshomem, the abomination of desolation, the Antichrist. Well, somehow, you're going to have a reconfederated Europe. We have that already in its embryonic stage, as Bill Koenig rightly pointed out. A non-democratic Europe. Israel looks to the West for a peace treaty. You're going to have some other kind of figure coming, making a treaty, who will once again enter the Holy of Holies the way Pompey did, you understand? It's a picture of the Antichrist. There's a reason the Vatican wants to be a peace broker in Jerusalem. But let's look further. You will have another Bar Kokhba. The book of Daniel tells us he'll make a treaty. He'll try to convince the Jews he's their savior. They'll look to him as a messianic figure. And as with Bar Kokhba, he will have religious support from a corrupt clergy. It will happen again to Israel. How will the Antichrist deceive the Jews? Same way Pompey did. Same way Bar Kokhba did. Same way Rabbi Akiva did. They'll be sold the same bill of goods. They have not learned the lessons of their scriptures or of their history. Therefore, they doom themselves to repeat those errors. As I said yesterday, if you want to know what's going to happen, look at what did happen. That's how he's going to sell them a bill of goods, a false formula for peace. When they look to any foreign power except the God of their fathers, they're heading for it. What else is going to happen? How else will he deceive? In God's economy, there are three kinds of people. Jews, Gentiles, and believers. Gentiles, goyim in Hebrew, ethnon in Greek, are the nations. Satan already has them deceived. The Jews, apart from the faithful remnant who know their Messiah, God has them deceived. So you've got the Jews and the Gentiles both under deception. Then you have the true church made up of both Jew and Gentile. That leaves the church. As Bill Koenig pointed out, even in America, the popular majority of those professing to be Christian 
and even a probable majority of those professing to be evangelical Christian deny the prophetic significance of Israel and the Jews or are given over to some version of replacement theology. We have deceivers like Rick Warren telling people to avoid end-time prophecy. Others like McLaren who were virtually anti-Israel. <coughs> Let's look. He's trying to deceive the church. What did Jesus say? If another comes, him you will believe. If you reject the true Messiah, you will follow a false one. If you do not heed the words of a true prophet, you will heed the words of a false one. If you do not heed the words of a teacher of truth, you will heed the words of a teacher of error. It becomes inevitable you'll be sucked in by the Bar Kokhba once you reject the true Christ you'll find another one. Well, let's look at it. I brought this with me. This is the biggest newspaper in the Republic of Ireland. This came out about seven weeks ago in Ireland, six and a half weeks ago, the Irish Times. The second report the Murphy Report, the first was the Ryan Report. Church routinely covered up sex, sexual abuse of children for 30 years. What you see here in America is much worse in Catholic countries like Ireland. Ireland is a culturally very Roman Catholic country. Let me just read one excerpt, what was uncovered by the investigations by the Irish government, admitted to, proven in court. <coughs> <coughs> Proven before the, the, the judicial inquiry. Church authorities use the concept of mental reservation, which allows senior clergy to mislead people without being guilty in the church's eyes of lying. In the Roman Catholic Church, you can lie to protect a pedophile sex criminal, and it's not a sin. Providing the pedophile sex criminal you're protecting is a child molesting priest or nun, and it's not a sin. Well, what about what Jesus said? Better to have a millstone tied around your neck than hurt one of these little ones. You understand thousands and thousands and thousands of children. And because of the political influence of the Catholic Church in Ireland, the report uncovered this. Four bishops obsessed with secrecy and avoiding scandal, four archbishops, protected abusers and reputations at all costs, in some cases with the blessing of the senior police chiefs. It goes on. They enjoyed what amounted to immunity provided by the police. They were telling the police in Ireland and the prosecutors, it's your obligation as a Catholic to protect child molesters at the expense of not protecting children. How could anybody in their right mind believe that this is Christian? This is the hierarchy. It's not a few bad apples. It's their bishops and cardinals. How can people believe in Roman Catholicism and think this is Christian? If you reject the true Christ, you'll get a false one. A man who ascribes to himself attributes of infallibility? <laughs> An institution that can say it's not a sin to lie to protect child molesting sex criminals? This is beyond sick. If you stop believing the truth, you'll believe anything. Even this.
There's a DVD, DNA versus the Book of Mormon, with Mormon molecular biologists from Brigham Young University being confronted with mitochondrial DNA evidence they could not refute as scientists, proving the Book of Mormon is a nonsense. It cannot possibly be true. How can anybody in their right mind believe it? You stop believing the truth, you'll believe anything. A Pope, a Joseph Smith, a Brigham Young, doesn't matter. It's not rational to believe these things. It wasn't rational to believe Bar Kokhba. But they did. It was not rational for Hasidic Jews to believe Menachem Schneerson, but they did. It was not rational for Orthodox Jews to believe Shabbat Taisvi or Jacob Frank, but they did. Why did they? If you stop believing the truth, you will believe a lie. If you stop following the true Messiah, you will find the false one every time. That is the lesson of Israel's history. That is what the second Jewish revolt teaches us as Christians. But now let's look. You would think anybody in their right mind after the first televangelist scandals with Jim Baker and all that, that people would learn and turn away from it. Instead, it's gotten worse. You would think after the failed so-called revivals of Toronto and Pensacola, they turn away from it. Now they go to Lakeland and it gets worse. The emerging church? Why will people who claim to be Christians believe this? Because they turned away from the truth. When you turn away from the truth, you turn away from the real Jesus. He is the truth. He didn't say, I know the truth, I'll tell you the truth. He said, he is the truth. You turn away from the truth, you've turned away from him. You choose to believe a lie. People who persist in Talmudic Judaism choose to believe a lie. People who persist in believing Mormonism with Jehovah's Witness choose to believe a lie. People who choose to remain in the Church of Rome choose to believe a lie. And so-called believers who choose to follow money preachers and emergent gurus choose to believe a lie. They choose to believe a lie because they are following a liar. They follow a liar because they no longer believe the one who is the truth. You stop following the true Christ, you will follow a false one. Look what it did for Israel. Look what it did to Israel. That's what it did for the Jews. Is it going to do anything different for the church? No, it will not. Because that's the way it was. That's the way it is. And that's the way it's going to be. There's a simple solution. Follow the real one. <laughs> Believe the truth. Pay the price for believing the truth and following the real one. It's better than paying the price for not believing it in the long term. That's for sure. Oh, but they're so sincere. I'm sure Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was very sincere at Yavne. But he died in terror. Oh, Mother Teresa was so sincere. Three months before her death, she confessed that she did not have the assurance of salvation. It's in the documentary. 
sincere. One of the most, probably the single most sincere person I ever saw in my life was on a film in Saigon in 1966. A Buddhist monk who poured kerosene over his head and lit a match. He was the most sincere man I ever saw in my life. If people are really sincere, they will seek the one true God. They will believe the one true scripture. And they will put their faith in the one true Messiah. This we may be sure of. For the others, that they may be sure of. May the Lord have mercy. God bless.